Well, two weeks ago, we started this sermon series on developing disciples entitled Disciple Makers as we're looking at developing generations of mature followers of Jesus. And, you know, that this is what we're here for. This is why we as the church is, exist, is for this great commission that no matter what may seek to divide us, no matter what we may disagree on, no matter what may, you know, again, divide us outside of this building, that we come together and unite as members of the body of Christ who are on this mission together, working together, hand in hand, as different members of the body of Christ who, again, share in this mission with one another. And, you know, initially, I, I, it, I hadn't planned, when I had planned out this sermon series, I hadn't, I had planned on taking a break on the sermon series to actually uh, do, you know, something, something different for Mother's Day. And it just struck me, God laid in my heart, how that is exactly what being a mother is all about. As I, as I said in the opening welcome this morning, that it is about developing and raising and teaching our children to grow up as mature followers of Jesus, who will also develop followers of Jesus, who will develop followers of Jesus. So motherhood is really all about discipleship and that God has built into creation this design where we are born into a family. We are born into a family with need where we have a, a, a mother and a father figure according to his design. Now that doesn't always uh, you know, some of us, uh, many of us grew up where that wasn't the home that we grew up in. But you can see in God's design that he built into it this, uh, this beautiful uh, discipleship structure of having a, God, having a godly woman and man to raise and teach and develop the disciples from within their home. And that we... Get to live life with them and not just teach them in, in words, but actually teach them in how we live our lives by exemplifying what that means. And so I, instead of, of, of taking a, a week off of our sermon series on discipleship, I rather this morning we're looking at developing mature followers of Jesus through intentional relationships. And that certainly entails and involves discipling as a mother, as a father, as a grandparent, as an aunt or an uncle, as just as a friend. You know, it, there, we're, we're going to talk about how motherhood is more than biology and that all of us can choose to develop and build into the life of someone else to mature them and grow them in their walk with Christ. And so in this series thus far, we've talked about how Jesus has, uses many different um, contexts, many different ways to, to invite new disciples and to mature and grow as existing disciples. We've talked about how he utilized large group settings in his teaching. We talked about how he also uh, disciples and grows and develops his followers through mission by commissioning them. And he sends out the 12 and they come back. And then he sends out the 72 and they come back. And then he sends out the 12 again with the great commission and likewise sends us out as well. And that mission, we grow as we go, that we grow and develop as we're involved in and invested in the mission that Jesus has given us. Well, this morning we're, we're, we're following that up by looking specifically at developing these intentional relationships uh, for the purpose of, of discipling. And uh, rather than just hearing it from me, I, I wanted for us to, to be able to hear uh, a story from, from someone else this morning. And so Danielle, uh, if you want to come up. Good morning, everyone. I'm Danielle, uh, and Alma and my daddy are always present 
front row cheering section. Um, Pastor Josh actually asked me to speak about a year ago uh, when a, a dear person that we loved very much passed away, uh, Joanne Harris. And um, I'm not very good at emotion. I'm retired from the military where emotion does not exist. And it has taken me five years to admit I'm allowed to have emotion. Now I get to express them publicly, and that's a little daunting for me. So Pastor Josh kept asking me, can you please come to the church? Can you speak about Joanne Harris? Well, maybe next month, maybe next month. Finally, after about six months, he stopped. And then a month ago, he said, hey, I want you to speak about her. You've got a month to prepare. By the way, it's going to be on Mother's Day. No pressure. So I have had... People, friends, family, counselors pumping me up, praying for me, and then my cheering section couldn't be here today. I'm like, okay, fine. Well, then out of the blue, a cheering section I never even thought of showed up in full force to cheer me on. So if I need help, I'm going to ask my cheering section spread out, jump up, and give me some some high fives or something, okay? Love it, thanks. <laughs> okay, so we'll go ahead and get started. Um, I am not a mother. I have no children. Um, I am a proud guinea pig parent. I adopted Darwin and Rocco after COVID. They were surrenders, I have no idea how old they are. But I am a proud parent of them. But I have not had the opportunity to have my own children. Next slide, please. In fact, I really didn't have much of a relationship with my own mother. I was the oldest of four, and the kids came, and I had to keep helping and helping, and uh, I spent a lot of time looking at my, my friend's parents. Wow, why can't I have one like that? And they helped me out with various things, and okay, got on with it. Then about in my 40s, things started changing. Next slide, please. I was looking at retirement. I was looking at, I really want to have children. I was looking at, oh no, I've got the ministry. How the heck am I going to be able to figure all this out? I am all by myself. God, send me someone. And see, I told you, emotions are a bad thing for me. <laughs> they showed up all over over the planet. I had women I had never even heard of sending me emails, giving me business cards, calling me on the phone, even in Guatemala, making sure that I knew I could do it. Random people at work. <laughs> there is no religion in the military. But I would have people walk up to me and say, God bless you, he's got a plan. And these women were tough. They were scary. They were very, very well-read, well-educated, and phenomenal. And they took time to invest in me when I wasn't quite sure I really deserved it because I had never had that from a mother before. Next. Then along comes Joanne Harris. I was coming back and forth between Virginia and Ohio a lot during my last assignment. And I love Pastor Jim. I've known him my whole life. Uh, he kept talking me up, but he also kept talking up this lady. She had her hair back in a slick bun. She had her glasses. She was dressed to the nines. She didn't smile or laugh overtly. She held herself with respect and prestige, and everyone adored this woman. I mean, you can see some of her accomplishments up here. I was terrified of this woman. Well, those of you who know me, I don't stay scared for long. I'm an EMT, and I run into the fire instead of running out of the fire. So I ran, and I attacked this woman. I will not be afraid of her. She's standing outside, surrounded by a whole lot of ladies, and I just stand there silently. I was not acknowledged, therefore I did not speak. Eventually the ladies peeled off. I turned her to walk away and she said, no, you stop. I go, shoot. She said, why haven't you spoken to me before? 
I was intimidated. She's like, why are you intimidated of me? I should be intimidated by you. And that started our relationship. She was right there beside me for everything. Next slide, please. This is who she was to me. She nurtured me. She loved me. She told me and showed me how to love so I could love others. She guided me. If I was on the wrong path, hey, you need to get this way, get going now, might have been her response. I've gotten that a lot. A little smack upside the back of the head if necessary. But she showed me the right way to go. She motivated me. She pushed me. But she also protected me. I went through a, a very, very difficult breakup uh, in September, right after we released from COVID. Every single day, she called. She texted. She said, if you don't answer me within 15 minutes, I am coming over. I am beating down your door, and I'm dragging you out of the house. She was the only one who every single day helped to build me back up after I felt destroyed. She took care of me. But if I screwed up, she would tell me, look at this point of view. Be patient with people. Don't judge people. But also don't be so hard on yourself. You're allowed to fail. That is how you learn. Don't be afraid to love. Next, please. And so this was... It was very difficult when she passed. I uh, got to know Tiffany in the back. <laughs> and Joanne was a very wise, intelligent woman. Anyone ever met Joanne? Hands? To know her was to love her, right? Yeah. And, but she could be intimidating. She knew her stuff, and she stood firm on her beliefs and her desire to love people. She ran our women's prison ministry. That still scares me. I've not overcome that one yet. But she did it all. She prepared me for when she died. She kept talking to me about Tiffany. Tiffany, got to go meet Tiffany. Got to go meet Tiffany. Fine, I'll go meet Tiffany with you. So she took me over and introduced me to Tiffany. As Joanne had a stroke and her health started failing, Tiffany was right there beside me, and I was right there beside her. Um, the last time I saw her was a few days before she passed. She really couldn't speak very well. But she motioned me to sit beside her on the bed and hold her hand, and we laughed, and we cried, and we hugged. And our last words were, I love you. A couple days later, I woke up with a dream. Have you ever woken up with a dream? You can kind of remember parts of it, but you don't know exactly what it was you dreamt. Woke up with one of those. Didn't think much of it. Then Tiffany called to tell me she had passed. I got my dream as vivid, and I can still see it. I don't know if she was a dancer. But this woman, she was dancing a full-on jig. She was smiling, she was crying, and she was praising the Lord. That is how she passed. And I didn't realize it until I was asked to speak at the funeral. I saw the other half of Joanne Harris right in front of me in Tiffany. All the qualities I don't have, she has. And I like to think that I have some qualities that Joanne has as well, so we can help each other through. What a mother. <laughs> what a mother. Next slide, please. So now, 
this has changed my life. I have gone through so many different things, so many hurtful, painful things. But I'm not a nobody. Joanne taught me I have something to give. It doesn't matter if I can give birth or adopt or foster. There are other people in the world, older or younger than me, that I can give something to. And if that something is the word of God and that's it, that is all you need. But when I look in the mirror, I hear all these ladies from all over the country. I hear them in my head telling me, it'll be okay. Don't give up. You still have a lot more to go. And we have a term in the military, boots on the ground. It doesn't matter what you think or what your plan is or what you're looking at doing. If you don't have people on the ground to do the mission, the mission doesn't happen. I have two feet. I'm, I got my combat boots at home, ready to go. I can be boots on the ground. And ladies, even the younger ones, you've got two arms, you got a smile, you got a mouth. Give some love. Next slide. I have two, <laughs> I have a niece and a nephew. I got a call on the 21st of April, tearfully from my sister-in-law. I need you. I have to give birth to my baby early or there's going to be a problem. I can't wait for my dad to come home from out of state. And by the way, your brother passed out six years ago when your niece was born and he's not allowed back in the delivery room. I need you. You are the only one in the family that can keep me calm and not pass out in blooded guts. Gotta love being in the military and EMT, I'm prepared. So I went into the delivery room with her and I got to see my nephew being born right there in front of me. I held him and introduced him to his mama. And then of course, I've got my little six-year-old Peyton. Hey, I'm probably the only Auntie Danielle in the whole world, especially spelled the way I am. But they've got wonderful parents, wonderful grandparents, great-grandmother even. But I have something I can give that is totally different than what they can give. Because my experiences, where I've tread, the miracles I've seen, the lessons I've learned, the places I've been, I have something I can still give, and I'm going to keep kicking butt at being an aunt. Thank you, Danielle. It's not easy to, to come up and, and share uh, when someone has had such a big influence on you and share from your, your heart. I, I appreciate you doing that, Danielle, and it, it's... Um, it's meaningful to actually uh, to be able to share stories with one another and, and share testimonies and um, share what, what other the role that other people have played in our lives and and the motherhood is as uh, Danielle had said and I had also said motherhood is more, is not just about biology and you know as a foster and adoptive parent you know that uh, there's so much more to more to being a, a mother or a father than than blood. And it's choosing to intentionally love and sacrifice for and protect and teach and grow and develop uh, someone um, in need, someone in need of that role in their life. And, and that's what, what Pastor Harris did for you, Danielle. appreciate you sharing. And appreciate Tiffany being here to support um, Danielle as, as she shared about your mom and I would just also say that when I, I had the the honor of, of going to Pastor Harris's uh, celebration of life that Danielle's story is just one story among many other very similar stories of, of people who um, Joanne intentionally built into and developed and loved and taught so just so thankful 
uh, for the influence that she had on you so that you could also in turn uh, do the same thing for, for others too. Um, and so, uh, okay, so Tiffany, if you would like to share a brief word with us as well. I had asked her last moment. We don't usually have the pleasure of having her with us, and I just thought, you know, it would be great to hear uh, from her as well. I'm going to try not to cry because I have not done very well sitting back there. But I am Tiffany. Um, I'm pretty sure in the sermons that I haven't been here, you guys have probably heard about me and my wonderful children. Um, I would not have picked a Mother's Day to spend in a better place. It's our last first. And this was the place I needed to be. So thank you and thank you. And I really don't have any other words to say because Danielle really said everything about Aunt Joanne. Um, she was a very loving, kind person and she would give you the clothes off her back. Um, and I really appreciate all of you guys and just keep us in your prayers. Even though it's the last verse, it's still hard. And we appreciate all of you. I'm going to try to do better. I actually did better walking in the church. I thought I would have had a complete meltdown and I didn't. I did cry sporadically, but it was, you know, what I expected. So we're going to try to come as a family and be around the people that she loved also as much as she loved us. So thank you all. And thank you. That went to my best. Thank you, Dolores. Thank you, Tiffany. So, pa Pastor Harris, one of the, the things that really has stuck out to me in hearing Danielle's story and talking to her and, and also Tiffany and, again, getting to know more about her is just this intentionality that it was not accidental, it was not you know, sitting around waiting for someone to come up to me and saying, hey, can you disciple me? And, and, that, and that often is, is, is the approach that a lot of Christians have is, well, sure, I, I'll, I'll, I'll disciple as soon as someone comes to me and as soon as that, that opportunity uh, arises. But that's not the type of discipleship that Jesus calls his followers to, that he doesn't call us just to be open and available to it if someone asks. He calls them to go and make disciples. There's an intentionality there. And we, we read from 1 Corinthians, Paul's words of follow my example as I am following Jesus. That, and, and isn't that how we need to be so closely following Jesus that to follow us is to follow him. That as a, as a mother, as a, as a grandmother, as an aunt, as a, as a father, as, as a, an older person who's discipling a younger person, that isn't that what it means to actually say, I am following Jesus so closely that if you just model what you see and what you hear, that you are going to find yourself closer to Jesus. That the footprints that I'm going to leave behind for my kids to step in lead to the cross. And that takes in a level of an intention that I am going to daily take up this cross and follow Jesus that closely. And this is the what Jesus calls his disciples to make disciples with this level of purpose and intentionality. It goes beyond just being open to, uh, to say yes when someone asks us, but it entails that we be actively pursuing, that we actively be going out and looking for relationships that we can build into someone else. Take them out for coffee. 
Meet him for breakfast. Invite him over to your house. And that could be someone in your family. It could be someone in the neighborhood, in the community, someone here in the church. Maybe it's being involved in the children's ministry. Yes, we need people down there. Maybe it's being involved in the youth ministry. Yes, we need volunteers in the youth ministry. Maybe it is launching a brand new ministry that does not yet exist here at Wintergreen. Maybe it's coming with me to Akron Pregnancy Services on Saturday in the walk to support them, or on Wednesday to Akron Pregnancy Services to set up a table and meet people in the community who are coming to this community event that they're holding. There are so many different ways, but it entails that we be open to and actively say, Jesus, here are my hands, here are my feet, here is my voice, use me. Open my eyes to the people around me, that you want me to influence for you. That you, I pray, Lord, that you would draw me so near to you, that I so faithfully live out your word, that those watching me are seeing the gospel lived out before them. And that again, by following in the footsteps left behind, they're being led to the cross. And we, we see Jesus having this level of intentionality as he goes to the woman at the well. See, Jesus doesn't go sit at the well and wait, and wait for her to say something. He doesn't, he doesn't just sit back and wait for the 12 disciples to come to him and ask him, hey, can I follow you? No, Jesus goes to them. He goes to Levi at his tax collecting booth. He goes to Andrew. He goes to, to John, to James and John as they're fishing. He goes to them and, and calls them to follow him. And Jesus has this intentionality, and he sends his disciples to go out and do the same. As we raise up mature followers of Jesus with that level of intentionality. And we see this in the Old Testament as well. We see this with, uh, you know, last year, last Mother's Day, uh, there's no test um, that's going to be sent out, but last Mother's Day message, we talked about, we talked about Samuel, the first prophet in Israel, and his mother, Hannah, and how she prayed for him, and how God was faithful and gave her Samuel, and how she fulfilled the promise that she made to God and said, God, I will give you and dedicate to you my son and to your work if you will bless me with the son. So we, that's, that was our focus last Mother's Day. Well, also beyond that, after Hannah falls through with that and brings Samuel to the temple, that she has played a role in discipling him and teaching him it's not until after he's of this uh, uh, child-rearing age that she brings him to the temple. And then from there, Eli, Eli teaches him and develops and disciples him. And though, even though Eli struggles with his own kids, we read in 1 Samuel, he does play a role in developing and leading and guiding Samuel as he responds to God's call on his life. We see also in this relationship between Elijah and Elisha as Elijah goes to Elisha and calls him to come after him and to learn and grow under him. Also in the, in the New Testament, we, we also see the example of Timothy. And I, I love... I love this, uh, this picture that Paul paints of Timothy and, and his being discipled within his own home in this lineage of generations of disciples, where we read in, in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 5, where Paul writes to Timothy saying, I have been reminded of your sincere faith, which first lived in your grandmother Lois and in your mother Eunice. And I am persuaded now lives in you also. The same faith that first began in your grandmother and then in your mother and now in you. So you see his grandmother poured into and developed and matured and discipled her daughter. And that, that, after, that being discipled and, and, and being taught and, and shown by example that Timothy's mom then raises him likewise 
to as a faithful follower of Jesus. So we see this generation after generation. And, and for, for many people, you might say, well, but that's not my family. My parents didn't live that out. My parents were terrible examples. Maybe they preached it, but they didn't live it. Maybe their, their words were over here, but then their footprints go over here by what they did, what they said, and how they lived their lives. And, that's, and that is a challenge for, for, for people who grow, who grow up without that example of, I don't even know what a godly man looks like. I don't even know what a godly woman looks like. What does a godly marriage look like? How do I be a godly parent if I didn't have someone exemplify that to me, if someone didn't paint that picture to me in my own home? But you know, in every family, you can stop and say, this starts with me. I will faithfully follow Jesus. And even though my parents did not, I will choose to follow Jesus so, so closely that my kids will have those footprints left behind to follow in and to leave for their kids and for their kids and for their kids. But not just for, again, biological children, but for all of those around who say, you know what? Maybe, maybe that's someone who I could speak life into. Maybe that's someone who God has put within my circle of influence for a reason. I love also in, in 2 Timothy, in chapter 2, Paul says, You then, my son, speaking to Timothy, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus, and the things you have heard me say in the presence of many witnesses, and trust to reliable men who will also be qualified to teach others. So Paul is saying, What you have heard me teach you, how I have poured into you and discipled you, would you then go and teach others so that they also can teach others? We have four generations of discipleship here in this one, in these two verses that Paul writes to Timothy. I have poured into you so that you could pour into someone else who will then pour into someone else. That is what it means to develop generations of disciples of mature followers of Jesus. And that is what happens when we are faithful to answer that call. Not because we're so good at it. You might say, well, but I'm not, how can I lead someone else? I'm struggling myself. But like we talked about with the mission last week, that as we pursue these relationships, as we pursue pouring into other people's lives, even as we struggle, Jesus can and will use and bless that. So this morning, I want to ask you, are you, will you commit to being intentional about finding and building these relationships for the purpose of developing disciples who will develop disciples? That rather than waiting for someone to come up to you asking to be discipled, will you pray about who God has, has placed around you that you can have an influence on, that you can have an impact on intentionally? Would you bow with me as I pray? Lord, we come before you and we thank you for all of those who have poured into our lives, whether they were our mother, whether they were grandmother, an aunt, or just a friend. Lord, we, we thank you for all those who have pursued a re discipleship relationship with us. And Lord, for those of us this morning who say, but I have never had anyone pour into me like that. Lord, I ask that you would pursue us, that you would send people to come and disciple us. And that, Lord, that we wouldn't just sit around waiting, but Lord, that we would obey 
you and your commission to go out and make disciples, and along the way, you will grow us. Would you use us, Lord, on your mission to make disciples? It is in your name that we pray. Amen.